Greetings from Lennoxville, Quebec, where I'm coming to you live from the Bishops University campus. My name is Dan Seneker, and I'm the Director of Student Recruitment and Retention here at Bishops, also an alumni from the class of 1994. Thank you for joining us as part of our Bishops University co-video isolation series. This is episode number one. So I'm excited that you're spending your isolation time with us today. Uh, what we're hoping to achieve is to provide you with engaging but resourceful sessions that will hopefully get you through these times and also help you with your work and study from home. Before I introduce today's guest though, I wanted to tell you a bit about our isolation series. Like many of you, we're finding our way through these unique times caused by coronavirus pandemic. And what we plan on doing is putting together a few short videos on a variety of topics from our campus experts that can help you as you progress through your post-secondary studies, no matter what format they're delivered in. So these sessions are gonna be done in two parts. The first is a pre-recorded session, like the one you're currently watching, which is often referred to as asynchronous where you watch the recording at your leisure, when you want and when it's convenient for you. We're then gonna follow it up with a live session or a synchronous viewing where you can engage with our speaker and interact with your peers by asking questions and getting answers live. So there's the plan, sounds pretty simple, right? So I should also mention before we get started that this idea was something that our first guest and myself came up with during conversations we had as part of our COVID-19 working groups. So I say thank you to him for the inspiration and the idea. But let's bring out today's guest. Today we have the two-time winner of the William and Nancy Turner Teaching Award, multiple-time recipient of the SRC Student Government Teaching Award, finalist for the 3M National Teaching Award, and has a whopping 4.6 out of 5 rating on my, ratemyprofessor.com, that highly scientific and reliable source. <laughs> So a big isolation welcome to Dr. Michael T. from the William School of Business. Yeah. So, <laughs> Hold the applause. For being our first uh, victim, I mean um, isolation expert. <laughs> Thanks. I got to tell you, this is a really really phenomenal idea that you got going. I really appreciate being the first guest and being invited. <laughs> so I think what we could do for today, and, and my whole intent when we actually talked about this, was to actually try to help people that could potentially be struggling studying from home, right? So if you're a high school student, a CISHEP student, even if you're a university student and you've switched online and you're kind of struggling, I want to take a look at the research to see what we could actually do to support you throughout this. And I think that's what we're gonna be focusing today's talk on. So Dan, if you will permit me, I am gonna pop open my screen. Yes, please. And let's get some PowerPoint presentations going so we can actually share some information. Can you see my screen? I can see your screen perfectly. Perfect, well let's roll. So my intent with this, Dan, is to try to keep this short and condensed within 10 minutes. There'll be a lot of tips on the slides. I'm not gonna go over all of them with you, but I just want to try to go over some key points to try to help out those that might be kind of struggling with different facets. So when you're looking from working from home, there, there's a whole body of research that's been done where people do work from home. And like anything else, there's pros and there's cons. Uh, if you're looking at some of the benefits of working from home, if you're a student, you're studying in the classroom, uh, maybe you've got some colleagues that are talking, maybe you've got a prof that's annoying you, uh, we've got the learning commons at Bishops. It could be your library where you're actually trying to work and there's a lot of noises. So obviously if you're working from home, those noises can be completely, completely minimized. And uh, typically if you were looking at research, you do save time. So suddenly, you know, you don't have a 20 minute, 30 minute drive into campus or into your high school or CIGEP. You can save that time. It can actually increase your productivity. You could be working in an environment that you really like. You can have schedule your schedule the way you actually want to go about scheduling it. These are all pros, but on the flip side, everyone's different. So some people could really, really find this challenging. Um, I'll, get, I'll give an example, like extroverts. If you're an extrovert and you're stuck at home, uh, you may find yourself talking to your plant. It can be very, very challenging if you're not actually reaching out to people and you don't necessarily have those face-to-face -face discussions that you normally would have. Right, and you're gonna find sometimes through those discussions, they can be really innovating and really stimulating. Those could potentially be minimized. 
It might not be your own environment. Dan, I'm going to be honest, it's going to be a Christmas miracle if we get through this video without my six-year-old twins barging in at some point in time, right? So your family, you may have to struggle. I've spoken to a lot of students that find it's challenging because it's not just the students that are working at home. Their mom and dad, their siblings, they're all at home trying to work, right? Absorbing the broadband, finding to find little spots where they can actually get the work done. And I know a big concern for some of my students has been, we don't really have class time. Everything's done asynchronous. So I, you know, I can just go watch these videos, but there's no real structure. So they, some of them really noticed a bit of a drop in their motivation. And also finding the proper times of when they should work on things. So these are the pros and the cons. Everyone's a little bit different. Uh, Dan, if you, at any point in time you got a question or something that could relate to you, you're more than welcome to ask. I'm happy to help out. Yeah, so, you know, besides uh, helping you, helping me with my problem of talking to my plants, um, <laughs> so one of the issues I'm, I'm personally kind of having a hard time navigating is I've got multiple points of stimulation and communication going on through the day. So I've got my text messages going, I have emails, I have Zoom calls, Blue Jeans, uh, Microsoft 365 Teams, I have this, that, and the other thing, plus I've got the kids. Um, coming through and everything like that. So any tips or tricks that maybe we can give on how do we deal with all these different stimuli that are, that are kind of bombarding us throughout the day? I think you're totally right. And it's a really fair point to bring up is that there is a lot of different platforms you can use to communicate with people from a distance. Uh, what you've discussed, I've spoken to people that are really struggling with this. And the sad part is, is you have to keep in mind that what's your personal preference for communicating might not necessarily be someone else's personal preference. So it's all about finding these middle grounds. And, and you know, if I had anything to suggest would be try to be open, try to find what that middle ground is, but maybe try to actually isolate what that is. So similar to you, I've been using FaceTime, I've been using Skype, I've been using BlueJeans. Uh, I'm currently teaching a class, I'm trying to minimize all communications through one platform which would be Microsoft 365 Teams, right? So to me, that makes it a lot easier. So if you're in a situation that you can minimize it, I'd say go for it, but I would engage your audience and find out what they like, what they dislike, and see if you can find what that happy medium is for everyone. Does that help answer your question? Yeah, thanks, Mike. I'll let you keep hey. on. My pleasure. Now I'll, I'll let you keep talking to your plants in the background. So if we're actually looking at how to stay focused, I'm gonna go through some key pointers that are, they're really not that complicated, but we often forget about these. So when we switched over to online, because we had no choice, uh, there was projects due in my class and a lot of students really struggled in terms of the project just seemed so large. I don't even know where to start. Uh, my number one tip is go with goal setting theory. It's probably the most proven theory that's supported by research and it works and it's not really that complicated. Uh, set a SMART goal. Right, set so something that's specific, that's measurable, something that you can attain, something that's relevant to you and something that's time bound. If you go and look on the internet, you're gonna to find tons of information that can actually help you do this. And it doesn't have to be something exceptionally large. It can be something that's really, really small, right? Reading, a, God, 20 minutes a day, you know, if you do it 20 minutes a day, it, it adds up over the course of a week. No different than people who write. Some of the best writers, Stephen King, I think gets up every morning excessively early, writes for a few hours. That's it, that's all, but it's done. So you're gonna be able to find little tricks, but it's predominantly setting these SMART goals. And there are things that are in your calendar that you can actually check off as you actually go, okay? Reward yourself. Hey, you hit your goal? Treat yourself, do something nice, right? So Dan, what are you gonna do after this webinar? I am going to, I don't know. <laughs> I'm going to do sure. something that I do with the family and uh, take some time of not working. There you go. I'm going to go for a walk. That's my reward, right? Your small wins. If you can actually have something to look forward to as a reward, that can be something that can actually push and drive you. Uh, you know, maybe things during in social isolation that you can do. Maybe you won't go on a trip. Well, maybe you can change rooms, go to your basement, do something there, watch your favorite TV show, binge on a series. FaceTime, Skype with some friends you haven't spoken to in a while. Yeah, I haven't been to the basement in at least uh, <laughs> two days. So that's going to be like Shangri-La this weekend. We talk about FaceTime and we can catch up, but I, I've got friends that have been doing really innovative things where they've actually set up uh, an online Cards Against Humanities. Like there's different things that you can do of getting creative. And I think most people, 
we've been kind of in this for a few months now. I think people are kind of getting a flow and, and they're kind of getting accustomed to doing a few things. Your personal preferences. Okay, so when do you like to work? Are you an owl or are you an arc? Daniel Pink has a great book on this that he'll talk about different ways of motivating yourself. Some people get their most of their work done early in the morning. That's you, you're an arc. If, if you like working at night, you're an owl. And it'll probably shift. Uh, the book will talk about young adults. Typically, the, the time that they're the most acute, based on research, it's around like 11 in the morning, right? And they tend to work a little bit later in the evening. If you know that's when you're working the best, set your times up accordingly to be the most efficient so you're getting the most work done during those times. Uh, the other thing I'd actually get you to do is think about journaling maybe a little bit. Think about... Okay, so if I sit down and I do my work, how long can I work while I'm maintaining my productivity level? And if you're watching this and you're a student, you're pondering what I mean by this, think back of those all-nighters you actually had to do, where you're putting in countless hours. I guess my question is, during those last hours, how productive were you and how high was your performance? Because for me, if I'm tired, my performance dwindles. It's probably taking me twice as long to get something done. And within that twice as long, I'm probably going to make more errors. So in hindsight, and I, I know this from experience, I'm probably better putting off my work, going to sleep, going for a walk, doing something else, and coming back when I am acute and I actually am more productive. And think about what environment works best for you. Uh, as a prop, this is going to sound really foolish, but if I actually want to get a lot of work done, Sometimes I'm better off going to a coffee shop where no one knows where I'm at, right? Because I can really plug away that. And we are in social isolation, so maybe the coffee shop is my attic or some place where my kids would never go, probably the laundry room. Yeah, so my, oh. one of the things I do is I, I take control of my schedule and I actually block off. I know that I'm most productive in the morning, so I block off time in my schedule in the morning so I can work on projects and things that I need to get done. And in my afternoons, when I'm usually hitting the wall or a little less productive, that's when I like to schedule my meetings to try and keep me engaged and keep me going for the rest of the day. Yeah, there's great research on that. You're totally hitting the mark with that. The afternoon, typically what it'll show is like around lunch, around one o'clock, there's kind of like this dip in performance that happens. So a lot of authors, what they'll recommend you to do is during that dip, that's when you can pump out like these tasks that, that don't require a lot of cognitive ability, like a lot of thinking responding to emails, responding to phone calls, getting those things done, they're, they're simple tasks, right? So you might as well block it in when there is a lull that's actually there. It's a great question. Uh, how to stay focused, maximize your home working environment. Uh, find a quiet spot. So currently I'm in my office, the door's locked. Uh, my twins should know actually not to come in because I actually got a little post-it sticker that they painted with a red circle meaning stop, don't come in. Right? And I've been able to find quiet spots like this because it's going to actually keep me more productive. The other thing I can tell you is key things that I have done is I've shut off my phone. It's plugged in, but it's completely shut off so there can be no interruptions. I am shut off. There's no pop-ups. My emails are closed. Uh, I've got colleagues that, they, you know, it can be very dangerous where they're checking their emails every 10 or 15 minutes. Each time you check within those 10 or 15 minutes, you're absorbing time in your day. And, and time is such a huge asset for you. You can never get that time back that you lose. So I've got some colleagues that are very clear. I'm checking my emails from four to five. That's when I'll respond to on a day-to-day -day basis. And they make that expectation crystal clear with everyone that they actually communicate. Hey, Mike, questions so, for you. Yeah. So any advice for students or anybody who might be watching who are in confined places, like they're in an apartment or they share with multiple people and it's hard to find a quiet spot in the house. Any suggestions on what they could do? Ironic. You know what? I spoke to two alums that are actually sharing an apartment in Montreal and they're both working from home. So, and they were telling me their story. And I think what they more or less did is they, they actually had an open discussion of picking environments where they were the most comfortable, discussing what their schedules were like on a day-to-day -day basis and try to minimize the impact. And by that, like if they had any important calls, they would split their days. So the calls aren't done at the same time. So you can actually hear the background, right? Other things that they've done is no different than what I'm doing right now, my earbuds, right? So if my wife's in the house and she's trying to work, uh, she'll hear my voice, but she won't hear your voice. But I think about does finding she, that commonality. Does she, What's want that? Your, does she want to hear your voice though? Oh, that's probably not. 
that, that, that's a separate webinar. Okay. <laughs> but there's little things, but I think if you go back to your question, I think being really open and discussing it and trying to set up areas that you're more comfortable in working, setting your schedule to see if you can actually find any, any different type of synergy between both of you of how, where you work best, what's the best times, so what's the best environment, what do you need to work? It's probably the best that you can do openly, right? And, and to be open to that and try to have a, at least a little bit of accommodation. So I'm gonna keep going through because I really don't wanna keep this too long. Your working environment, what's your workspace like? Uh, I can't work in clutter. So my sense is, you know what? Every time when I finish my day, I clean up my clutter. So the following day when I come, my desk is completely clean. Uh, your working station, should be comfortable. I'm on a standing station right now. You're gonna see me kind of moving around. For me, when I'm doing these webinars, it's something that I really, really enjoy. The door is closed and there's a post-it there. So no one's really interrupting me unless it's an emergency. I'm gonna get into how to manage your time. Uh, I talked about time being a really, really important asset. Uh, you know, you gotta build routines, set your goals, block off your time. If you got an agenda, get your agenda. Write down your goals, block off those blocks that you actually need to get things done on a daily basis. And I think you'll find that it will be rewarding. It can take a while to break a habit, but just focus in on that. That continuity of doing things on a regular basis will really, really, really be helpful. And you can always go back to your SMART goals. You don't like something, change your attitude, right? You might be getting into a little bit of self-fulfilling prophecy that's there. Uh, examples that I would use with my students is, uh, you know, if they mention, I really don't like writing, I really dislike writing papers, I'm not interested in this at all. With an attitude like that, why would you want to? So it might be really beneficial to flip it around and say, you know what, I'm gonna write on something that I can probably use and it'll be really helpful to me. Just a little switch like that. Same thing as a test, I'm really anxious for my test, flip it. It's a really good opportunity for me to show my teacher what I learned. So really you're trying to turn your attitude around. The other thing is make it fun. Dan, you're gonna find this excessively surprising. As a prof, I really dislike marking. What? So if I have to, yeah, I know, isn't that hard to believe? So if I have to mark, I'm gonna to try to pair it up where it's an event and I'm doing something fun. Sounds kind of foolish, maybe I'll pop in. I'm a huge music fan. I'll pop in a new record or a new CD or any type of different playlist I haven't listened to before, which can actually help motivate me. So it's a bit of an event. And uh, you're gonna see me right now drinking coffee Watch what you're putting in your system, right? If you're pushing anything and that's really high caffeinated, I'm thinking energy drinks. If I'm drinking a lot of sugary drinks like Gatorade, uh, juices, if I'm eating junk food, chips, candy, like the sugar will give you a bit of a high, but what goes up must come down. You'll have a really large down going down. So make sure you're continuously staying hydrated. If you're not skipping meals, you're putting good things in your body. Make a schedule, we've been over that. Block off your time. Uh, prioritize your tasks, what's coming up. Whatever's coming up the most is what you should be putting your time in. Watch out for uh, things that are a waste of time, right? If you've got priorities to do and you find yourself continuously answering to emails that really aren't a priority, it's gonna absorb a lot of time in your day, right? There's some really good books on that. Uh, Seven Habits of Highly Effective People will give you a quadrant that kind of gives really good suggestions of how to structure your time. Do a Google search, you'll be able to find it. Avoid multitasking. Your brain, we all think we're good at multitasking. The research is showing us we're really not good at it. So if you can really minimize what you're doing, you'll probably be a little bit more productive, if not significantly more productive, right? And the key thing I wanna really focus on this, and I've had a lot of calls with professionals over the course of the week, it's really hard. You go to school, you get your school environment. You go home, you get your home environment. And, and Dan, I don't know how you're experiencing this, but a lot of professionals that reached out to me say, I'm really struggling. Everything's blending into one another, right? So now the idea is, is that I'm actually working from home. Uh, so I can't really get that disconnect because work's always there. I've got people that are owls that I work with. So consequently, they're emailing me in the evening and they're texting me in the evening. So it's really important that for some people that works, but for you, if it doesn't work, you really need to make sure that you're blocking off your time to get that recovery, to recharge your batteries. Because if they're not recharged, you know, day after day that they're not, you're not recharging those batteries, it can get a very, very exhausting and it could potentially even teeter on burnout rates. I think it's- so Again, what's that? I was just gonna say, I think it's important to know that everybody is kind of dealing with this crisis in a different way and they also work differently. So like you said, 
you know, I'm the same. I have some colleagues that prefer to work at 10 p.m. until 2 a.m. because of their home situation with kids and other things, and then others that like to do it at five in the morning. And it's hard to kind of not get caught in their schedule and stick to what works for you as best as possible. And it is, it's completely subjective, right? Particularly what people are gonna find as stressful is gonna be subjective and how you manage your stress is gonna be completely subjective too. So I think it's really important for people to take the time to actually recognize that. And, and you know, and to be respectful that if they like, I've got no problem if people are, you know, if they wanna work in the night till two or three in the morning, have at it. That, unfortunately, that's a poor fit for my working schedule and how I like to work, right? So I think being open about that and recognizing that and having a discussion about it can actually minimize the impact of that over time. I got a few slides set up if you are trying to do some work-life balance. Look, follow your schedule, set reminders. Uh, you know, a reminder can be as simple as setting a timer. I know I work best at 50 minute intervals. And at 50 minutes, I have to stand up and walk around to get my blood flow going. Uh, there's tons of apps that you can use for that. They're called Pomodoro apps. Uh, focus to do, Ingros, brain focus, productivity timer. You can find all these apps on an app store. And some students find they're excessively, excessively helpful. And tell people your work schedule, right? Uh, you brought that up beforehand, put a do not disturb on your phone. So certain hours are completely, completely blocked off. And you got tech free zones in your house. We have some. Dining room, tech free, don't bring your phone. It's not welcome there, right? Don't bring your laptop in there. Those are tech free areas where you can actually go and not have to worry about that. And even for me, you talked about uh, Cell phones in the evenings, Dan, I turn mine off often before I go to bed. It's not even in the same room, so I'm not tempted to even look at it. Yeah. So, yeah, and, and if you can, I mean, the worst thing is, is if you are working alone and you're getting bored and it's getting kind of tedious and you're losing that motivation, if you do have someone that's in your immediate environment, you might be a little bit more prone to interact with that person. <laughs> and if you're both not motivated, it could actually increase your procrastination. So really sometimes, you know, you really got to look at what's best for you and how to move ahead with that. And, uh, you know, we're talking about balance. The key thing about stress is having those support tools that are there, being able to reach out to the community. I love hearing from my students. I constantly reach out to them. I've been chatting with other faculty members, friends and family, and there's different ways you can do that. Uh, we've used Slack, WhatsApp, Skype, Zoom, tons of different tools, right? But these are all things that can actually help you connect with people. So if you are feeling unmotivated, if you are feeling kind of down, if you are feeling overwhelmed, by all means, reach out. And you know what, on a keynote, I just wanna say, I think most people are doing well and, and people can, they, they have it in them. They can 100% do this. And I've got one little note there. Uh, prior to doing this webinar, a student reached out to me and it seemed like they were really stressed about doing things perfectly. And I don't know how I can do this perfectly. I'm doing it from home. Don't let perfect be the enemy of good enough right? Don't let that strain you from giving it a try and doing the best that you can, because often that's enough. So that was my talk. I'm hoping people found it helpful. Do you have any other questions, Dan? No, I think that's great, Mike. Uh, you know, thanks so much for doing that. Uh, and uh, I'm sure our viewers are going to be smart enough to take a few of your points and uh, turn them into valuable skills moving forward as we progress through this and beyond. Um, so thanks again, Mike. That concludes episode number one of our co-video isolation series. Don't forget to join us for the live Q&A session with Dr. Teed and then our next episode, which is going to be coming to a video screen near you. So thanks again, everyone. Stay healthy, stay safe, and take care. We will get through this. Take care, everyone. Take care.